so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. The Black Widow. This spider is the most venomous in North America and carries a neurotoxin that rivals some of the deadliest animals on the planet. With its shiny black abdomen and distinct red hourglass-shaped marking, the Black Widow spider is among the most venomous arachnids in the world. With a bite believed to be 15 times more potent than a rattlesnake's, the female Black Widow has a habit of eating her male partners after they mate. Use them, then devour them. It's a practice known as sexual cannibalism. In 2001, Adelaide housewife Michelle Burgess met Kevin Matthews at the local tyre repair shop he owned and ran. From the moment she laid eyes on him, Michelle wanted Kevin. But there were two things standing in her way. Her husband, Darren, who worked for Kevin, and Kevin's wife, Carolyn. But it didn't stop Michelle from seducing the father of three into an affair. As Kevin maintained the appearance of a healthy marriage to Carolyn and a contented lifestyle in the suburbs, he spent his spare time fantasising about the possibility of a future with Michelle. As Kevin grew more and more consumed by her, Michelle grew ever more powerful over him. Sexually, emotionally, psychologically, Kevin would do anything for her. It was exactly where Michelle needed him. Their blissful forever was just around the corner. But first, they'd need to kill their two spouses, cash in the life insurance and live happily ever after. As Kevin drew up two murder contracts at Michelle's request, she was juggling another relationship with a career criminal, David Key. David thought he'd found his soulmate. Michelle knew she'd found her hitman. As Michelle planned her future with Kevin, she was filling David's head with false hope that he was her romantic priority. Kevin, meanwhile, had become convinced that Darren, Michelle's husband, and his wife, Carolyn, needed to be taken out. And David had become convinced he was the man to do it. On the 12th of July, 2001, David Key confronted mum of three, Carolyn Matthews, on the steps of her home. Kevin was at the video store at the time with the three boys, a planned distraction which left Carolyn home alone. She came out of the front door with some recycling when she was confronted by David Key. With nowhere to turn, she was forced back inside her home Michelle was there too, goading David. If you want to be with me, prove how much you love me. Kill her, she told him, as Carolyn Matthews begged for her life. When Kevin Matthews returned home with his sons, he knew what they'd be coming back to. And even still, he let his boys head inside before him to discover their mum unconscious on the kitchen floor, covered in blood. Shane Matthews, Carolyn's son, was just 13 years old. He dialed triple zero straight away. We need an ambulance, quick! What's happened there? She's, her wrist is flashed. Okay, there's a lot of bleeding. Yes, 13. How old is she? She's 13. How old is she? That's not the fault! It was too late. There was no way that anything could have helped. I believe that she was definitely gone by then anyway. Carolyn Matthews was gone, and the woman who orchestrated her death would become known as the Black Widow of Adelaide. They're the Black Widow in the centre of that web with all of these little males around them, and they're either killing them or they're using them. And she's obviously not concerned about how that happens.
I'm Emma Gillespie and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. The story of Michelle Burgess and Kevin Matthews has been described as a story of the two sides of town. The safe, middle-class existence of the Matthews family in suburban West Lakes, Adelaide, and the chaotic and disturbed world of Michelle and her hitman boyfriend, David Key. For Michelle, and female psychopaths like her known as Black Widows, Kevin Matthews was the whole package. He made more money, had a better house in a nicer part of town, and lived a better life than the one her husband, Darren, had tried to give her. In 2001, Michelle Burgess and Kevin Matthews plotted to take two lives. And while they'd only see through one half of their twisted plan, before they could kill again, they received two of the longest non-parole periods in South Australia's history. Today's episode is an examination of female psychopathy, using the case of Michelle to interrogate the actions and mentality of female killers, or black widows. And when it comes to understanding the criminal mind, Tim Watson Munro has a better grasp than most. He's a criminal psychologist with nearly 45 years' experience. Starting his career at Parramatta Jail in the 70s, Tim has gone on to assess over 30,000 people, including some of Australia's most notorious minds. Joining Tim is Dr Xanthi Mallet, an internationally renowned forensic anthropologist and criminologist who specialises in behavioural science as well as DNA and craniofacial biometrics, examining how the misinterpretation of forensic evidence can shape the justice system. The pair have worked together on multiple true crime documentaries and projects in the past, and this year they've come together for a new podcast called Motive and Method, where the science of the mind meets the art of investigation. Tim and Xanthi join us now. To start with, what is a black widow? Where does that term come from? Well, black widows is a sort of generic term given to psychopathic women who either kill or organise other men to kill other men. It's generally driven by profit, although I think the psychodynamics behind it are probably more complex than that. Black widows, of course, as spiders, tend to eat their partners, so I think that's where the term came from. One of the points of difference Xanth and I have is, you know, the idea of the female psychopath. Xanth feels they're different to men psychopaths. I think that the common ingredient to all psychopaths, which is not a term that's used so much these days, is people are now described as individuals with an antisocial personality disorder. These people are individuals who have no remorse, they have no insight, they have no empathy and uh, consequently they're, you know, untreatable. Yeah, and I agree with Tim that psychopaths have those common traits, males and females. I just think the way that it presents itself and the way they interact with other people is sometimes different. And I think male psychopaths are often very charismatic, they're very calculating, and so are the females, but males are more likely to kind of act themselves where I think whereas the females are generally more manipulative would you say Tim they're more likely to coerce and manipulate somebody who's psychologically vulnerable into doing something for them and that's where the black widow element comes in and females are more likely to use emotional blackmail so they may self-harm, for example, but not because they're genuinely emotionally distressed as a release. It will be a controlling mechanism to make somebody sympathise with them and kind of control them through these behaviours. So I think there are many similarities, but I think the women are just a little bit more overtly manipulative than the men. I agree. I've assessed over 30,000 people in my long career. And amongst those 30,000, there's been a high percentage of psychopaths, mainly men, but women as well. You know, the male psychopaths manipulate as well, but they use different mechanisms. And I've interviewed and assessed a number of so-called black widows, 
women who have manipulated and beguiled men into killing other men on their behalf. And I think one of the primary differences is that those women use their sexuality as a weapon. They tend to prey on vulnerable men and then the person feels he's in love with this individual and with the affliction of time, they start placing demands upon them, culminating in, look, uh, this guy, he's been bullying me, my ex-husband, uh, and if you really loved me, you'd help me out by killing him, and then we can claim the money. The way that it's actuated may be different, but the fundamental psychological construct of the psychopath is, you know, no remorse, no empathy, and a lot of manipulation, but it's a different way of beguiling the uh, person. Yeah, and I think we just know less about female psychopaths and the way they present because there's been less studies of them because normally when you think of a male psychopath, you think of violent male psychopaths, but obviously we also have what we class as the successful psychopath, and I won't name any, but I'm thinking of maybe some politicians you know, who are very successful in their roles, but they get there because they will do anything to anybody to get what they want. It's all about self-interest. They have, as Tim said, no sympathy, no empathy, no compassion, no capability to really love anybody. And so we've kind of studied that group of individuals, but women have kind of slipped under the radar. So I think we've understand less about how psychopathic traits express in women, which is probably very socially engineered the way each of the genders really represents their psychopathic traits. And the reason I started looking at it is because I'm sure I've got one in my family. And I was thinking, what is wrong with her? And that's when I started to look at the limited research around female psychopaths and what they do. And I guarantee you no one. And I'm not saying a violent one, not like a black widow, but they're the kind of women who, if they're in your social circle, will enjoy causing trouble. They're the ones who are sleeping with you know their friends' boyfriends and stirring and gossiping and backstabbing and not just doing, but enjoying it. They enjoy the distress and trauma that they're causing and the power that it gives them. I think there's a perception out there that you only find psychopaths in prison and they're killers, they're bank robbers, they're rapists, you know. I've certainly assessed many, many males generally who have been very high up in the corporate ladder and they could equally be described as psychopathic individuals because of those variables. They're ruthless. They want to get to the top. They don't care whose lives they destroy. And often when they come into a new business, they destroy the culture of that business because of their psychopathic tendencies. It's certainly unusual for our listeners to be hearing about a female psychopath. You know, we regularly dive deep into the depravity of men, but today we're talking about Michelle Burgess. Where does the story of Michelle and Kevin kick off? How was it that these two people came to be in each other's lives? So they actually met through her husband. So he was working for her husband and they came into contact that way. And so the plot became that they would rid themselves of their prospective partners and then they could be together. And as Tim said, you know, this is kind of what these women do. They say, if you really love me, the only thing standing in our way of our true love is our partners and their families. She didn't want to do it herself though. These women tend not to act themselves, but he wasn't game to actually commit the murders himself either. So the first target was actually his wife and she coerced another guy she was in a relationship with that she'd used her sexual powers over to kind of groom him, in essence, a violent individual into killing the wife that was in the way. And the way that this was done, she wrote up like murder contracts. You know, this was highly premeditated and coercive and... She went round to the house with the other guy and basically she talked him up until he was in a bit of a frenzy and he brutally murdered her in the kitchen. And the really sad thing about this is the husband then came home knowing what had happened because this is all planned with the two sons who he'd taken out of the house to get out of the way so that this could take place and let the two boys walk into the house first and find their mother brutally murdered in the kitchen and that father left them with that memory and I think of all of the parts of this story you know you've got the premeditation and the callousness 
and all of that. But to let two boys walk into a home knowing they're going to find their mother murdered is the cruelest thing you can do to your own children, I think. So she is a true black widow and he is ultimately a coward. But yeah, it's one of the stories that kind of stays with you because you just think about what those boys went through, what they'll continue to go through when they found out their father was actually partly culpable for the murder of their mother. Can you speak to the impact psychologically that that moment might have had on those boys at that time in their life? Is that age particularly vulnerable or or pivotal? Oh, absolutely. I mean, adolescence is a critical developmental stage anyway. It's often difficult for adolescents to negotiate the passage from childhood to early adult life. To discover your dead mother at any age, but particularly that age, in those circumstances, without having examined these people, so I'm speaking more generically in terms of other cases I've done, but obviously they would develop significant and severe symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. They would be hypervigilant to danger. They'd have flashbacks, nightmares, a loss of trust in others, low self-esteem, severe depression, anxiety. Often people develop what's described as survivor guilt. It's quite irrational. They walk through the what ifs, what if I'd been there, I might have been able to protect mum, that type of thing. And so they're burdened with symptoms of guilt as well. The aggravating feature in this case, of course, is they're effectively orphaned because dad's been behind it. And so I would imagine for people in that situation, based on you know many people I've examined over years, the symptoms are intense and they're lifelong. There's really no cure for this type of thing. There may be a lessening in the intensity and the frequency of the symptoms manifesting themselves. But, you know, any death in a family is very difficult to negotiate. But a death like that, with that context, very hard to move past it. I suspect they probably can't. I think it probably causes real conflict too. I mean, again, generalising, I've looked at other cases where there's been intrafamilial murder that's within the family. So you have one family member killing or arranging to kill another family member. And it's all the conflicts that that arises within the individuals because these boys have obviously lost their mother and they will feel probably very conflicted over their feelings potentially of any loyalty to their father and any sympathy they might feel with their father, which is kind of juxtaposed against the fact that they know that he was involved. But that kind of natural empathy, if you've got a close relationship with somebody and how could that person you think loves you have caused you that trauma and your mother that trauma? And I think all of those conflicts are really going to additionally psychologically impact especially young boys who are trying to manage all of those emotions and it's going to be incredibly difficult for them. Do we know anything about Michelle's marriage to Darren, what their relationship was like? Yeah, I mean, I don't know too much about their relationship. I don't think that it was on the rocks or anything like that. And I think as far as he was concerned, you know, obviously all marriages have ups and downs, but certainly she would have had other affairs, you know, she would have been involved with other men. So I think she had probably coerced him in the same way that she's coerced all these other men. So he will probably have been blind to many of her characteristics because you've got to remember these people are very good at hiding their true selves. They're chameleons, basically. And Tim will have seen this too. When you talk to a true psychopath, they're very good. They wear what I describe as a mask. So normally they have this mask onto the world and they're very good at controlling what other people see. So she will have absolutely controlled her relationship with her husband and what he thought was happening could have been totally different to what her perception and what the truth was. But when you catch them out and when you challenge them and when you make them show their true selves and they haven't chosen to, then that really annoys them. And people will describe a psychopath's eyes as going black And I've seen that a couple of times. Have you ever seen that, Tim, when their faces literally change when you say something that pushes a button and they don't like it? The mask drops. You see the true self for a moment before they can gather themselves and hide again. And it's like, there you are. I saw you. And there's that moment between you when they know that you've seen their true self and they don't like it. 
I mean, one of the great skills that psychopaths have, men and women psychopaths, is that they can mirror the behaviour of the people they're dealing with to develop rapport with them. They have a great capacity to zero in on the vulnerabilities of the individual that they're dealing with, self-esteem, sexual needs, all those sorts of things. And as Zanth described earlier, they're generally charming, affable people, highly manipulative and so on. They're always on the prowl, these people, and they'll move from one victim to the next, to the next, to the next, and that's kind of how it develops. Would you say then that it's likely in her marriage to Darren before this affair with Kevin, which, you know, may have been the 10th, may have been the 1st, may have been the 100th, that Darren never really saw her without that mask, that he perhaps never knew the true version of Michelle? I think people are often too close to these relationships. And as we said, they're very good at putting on a front. And so, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he had no clue. And you've got to remember, most people are not good at picking up the signs of psychopathy. I mean, Tim would spot it a uh, hundred meters. He'd smell it out. And once you know the signs, you can spot it much more easily. And I think I'm quite good at it now, but most people aren't. And you'll probably pick up on little things like Tim said, they're really good at mimicking and reflecting normal behaviors, but they give themselves away often because there'll just be something that's not quite right a tone that's not quite right, a look that doesn't quite match what they're saying because they're not genuinely feeling these things like sympathy or remorse or empathy. So what they're trying to do is copy what they think is right, but sometimes it's just not quite perfect. And that will make the average person or somebody who's who's reasonably intuitive just go, something's wrong. You know, I don't know what it is, but I can just feel something's a bit off. Whereas Tim would look at them and go, yeah, I know. I, can, I know everything about you from that one look on your face. But for the average person, they may pick up on little hints and feelings, but they won't be able to consolidate that and solidify it into a, there's a problem, this person isn't quite as they seem. It's that kind of intense reaction. And that's that sort of counter transference process that we're talking about. And it's not just with psychopaths, you get it with people with all sorts of conditions. But there's often an over-familiarity. The thing about these people, getting back to women, women psychopaths, black widows, they will often love bomb the victim. So they will shower them with affection. They will tell them, you know, they're the best person they've ever been with sexually. They're, they make them feel very powerful and masculine. And... They can turn from adoring partner to righteous avenger very quickly if they don't get what they want. And, uh, you know, even beyond Black Widow, as many people I think have been in that situation where they've been love-bombed by someone almost from the get-go and then the manipulation starts and then with some of these people it goes that extra mile or two. It's powerful stuff. It's really the extreme end when you're coming to the Black Widows of coercive control, isn't it? Because if you look at coercive control and how that can lead to domestic violence, it's really the same thing. It's the engendering kind of trust and love and positive feelings. And then the insidious behaviours begin, the jealousy, the control, the manipulation, the financial control, sexual violence. You know, it all builds from this foundation of getting somebody in a position of vulnerability and then taking advantage of that. So I think coercive control has some of these elements as well. And But anyone can end up in that situation because you can't see it at the time. When somebody is being so positive and emotionally rewarded, you can't see the negatives. And then when the insidious controlling behaviours start to slip in, you don't see them for what they are often until it's too late. So this notion of controlling men is what motivates these black widows. In the case of Michelle, how did that control present itself? What did she do and say? How did she behave to get these men to do her bidding? Well, it's the process that we described, you know. There was love bombing, there was manipulation, there was promises of a, a great rosy future down the track with money. And if only we can get rid of the obstacles that are obstructing that, we will live happily ever after. Now, I mean, it's clearly delusional thinking, but it's not based in psychosis. 
these people are bad. They're not mad. They know what they're doing and they know how to press the various buttons of the person that's doing their bidding. The end game, of course, get the other person out of the life and move on happily ever after. The kids survive. Probably she becomes a stepmother. And, you know, who can project what might have happened in the future? But it may well have been that some years down the track or sooner, he too may have become a victim because they don't stop. It's exciting for them as well. It's not just about money. Do you think there were any genuine feelings there? I guess I'm trying to understand whether or not, you know, this was all about control and getting what she wanted or if Michelle might have at least had some kind of connection with Kevin. Look, I really doubt that on the basis of these people don't have genuine feelings at all. They might have this sort of idealised, romanticised notion of love, you know, with all the endorphins floating around and the dopamine and the excitement attached to it, but it's clearly not what we would describe as genuine committed love. It's something else. It's lust. But they may believe they're in love and they may actually believe that it's all going to work out okay. But there's nothing sincere about psychopaths at all when it comes to feelings because the only people they ultimately care about is themselves. He may have thought maybe uh, we have a future and he might have believed he was in love and, you know, rather than being in lust. And that, of course, sets up a very powerful sort of power dynamic where he'll do anything to maintain the love and the love bombing and the affection that can be withdrawn as a weapon. And if you're a good boy, it'll be restored. And those feelings may have been genuine. He may have believed he was in love. He must have believed something to have, you know, acted on this and followed through with it to that extreme. But I don't think that she was capable of any feelings beyond those that advanced her life. And you've got to remember, she not only was having one relationship, she actually coerced another man to commit the murders. David Key is the third party player in this scenario. So she'd also coerced him with, well, possibly financial rewards, but also kind of sexual coercion. And she made him kind of almost frenetic before he went into that house. She built him up so that he would go in and commit a very violent act. So you're thinking if she is really in love and is really removing these people from their lives so they can have this romantic future, then she's also coercing sexually other men into involvement with that. And I get the feeling that she probably knew fair, you know, that she was going to remove her husband from the picture and at some point she'd have moved on. And, yeah, either one of them may have been the next victim because they would have become a problem to her at some point. Can you take me to that day and give me a bit of a closer understanding of the lead-up to that final moment? the conversation, the pressure that Michelle had put on this hitman. David Key was apparently not keen to go through with it in the end. He was trying to kind of step back from this. She was kind of working him up, you know, basically pressuring him psychologically. I don't think he's a particularly intelligent individual and I think she was very much more intelligent than him and he was fully under her control, but he was still trying to step back. He obviously understands the seriousness now. They're literally driving to Carolyn's house to commit this act. And so she is just winding him up. I don't know what she was saying to him, but she knows every button to press to make sure that he's going to go through with this. So they're walking towards the house and she is making him angry and aggravated all to get him to the point where he is so heightened emotionally, he is willing to go in and brutally murder this woman who he doesn't know, he has no connection to, but Michelle has such control over his emotions that even though he wants to step back from this, he can't because she has literally got him like a bug in a jar, kind of heating him up. The execution itself, I think, Xanthi, you've described as an overkill. What did you mean by that? Oh, she was stabbed multiple times. So overkill in a forensic and criminal context is literally where more is done to kill somebody than is necessary. So from my perspective, from a behavioral perspective, if you walked into a scene and somebody has been stabbed, you know, 20 something times in the torso, and it's what we would describe as frenzied, a frenzied attack, 
then you would look at that and go, this is personal, or there's some other reason that this person has entered this frenzy. So, you know, if you walk in and this is an interpersonal crime, so it's domestic violence incident in somebody's home and they've been stabbed multiple, multiple times, especially if there's a lot of injuries to the face, that can be a sign that somebody is trying to literally obliterate somebody's identity if they attack the face. But if they're attacking the torso and they're not only stabbing them once or twice to ensure that they're deceased, they stab them again and again and again. And then you're seeing that true frenzy then that means that that person was in a very heightened emotional state when they committed those acts. Now, David Key had no personal reason to be emotionally that angry or show that kind of level of vehemence towards Carolyn that had all come from Michelle and her talk to coerce him into that activity. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Emma Gillespie. I'm speaking with criminal psychologist Tim watson Munro and forensic anthropologist and criminologist Zanti Mallet. Tim, the notion of outsourcing the dirty work, you know, hiring a hitman to do what you won't do yourself, does that reveal anything about Michelle's behaviour? You know, she's proven to be a dangerous person, so why not do it herself? They don't want to get caught. They want someone else to take the fall if it goes south. It's remote control murder, basically. And again, it's the psychopathic disposition. I think beyond that, it's also about what we've discussed. It's about controlling someone, getting some sort of thrill and pleasure out of being so powerful that you can coerce another individual to kill another individual. And that's part of it. I've had a number of hitmen as clients over the years. They do it for money, primarily. They don't do it for anger or lust or greed or anything. Well, greed's part of it. And the people that coerce them to do it or ask them to do it, it's the same dynamic. They do it because they don't want to be caught. You know, they want to be at arm's length between the offence and themselves. And even if the offender is caught, it doesn't necessarily follow that the person that paid for the contract will be caught. So I think that's part of it. What do you think, Zanth? Yeah, and I think that's a common trait of psychopaths generally. They're very, very manipulative and very coercive. doesn't matter whether they're male or female, but they will always be risk adverse. They will always weigh up how do they stay at arm's length so that somebody else is going to take the blame because most psychopaths are actually more intelligent than the average person. So they plan, they're premeditated, they will look at ways to get out of situations. They'll put mitigations in place And so she is very intelligent and therefore able to read people's emotions and make sure that she is protecting herself as much as possible. But she's also enjoying the control she has of these individuals, that she's basically using these guys like little puppets. And that control becomes addictive. So it may not always manifest itself in organising others to kill people. In its less virulent form, it's all about control within a relationship. And they'll move from one to the next to the next, depending on what their needs are, because they get bored. But with some of these individuals, as with Michelle, obviously the the psychopathic component to her personality was more intense. I mean, how anyone could organise that, particularly where there's children involved, and I'm a pretty hardened old soul after all these decades at the coalface, It's a crime that it chills me to the bone, that one. It's extraordinary in its brutality, its planning, and the complete disregard for the consequences of those actions on others. As Kevin Matthews made tearful pleas to the public and media, begging for information about his wife's murder, investigators were already closing in on him. Surveillance footage had revealed Matthews meeting up with Michelle Burgess, and evidence of their affair was undeniable. A breakthrough eventually came through with a major clue left at the crime scene by hitman David Key. His distinctive boot prints were everywhere across the bloodstained kitchen floor crime scene of Carolyn's murder. David Key had been bragging about the hit to friends, and he was finally arrested when police pulled him over for speeding, wearing the same boots he'd used to kill Carolyn Matthews. A short time later, the hitman confessed. He told police he destroyed the murder contract Michelle drew up 
by eating it in a sandwich. But the contract for the hit on Michelle's husband, Darren, was still very much in existence. And once they had it and Key's confession, police arrested Michelle Burgess and charged her with Carolyn Matthews' murder. They literally had a contract. She did up all these documents with photographs, with where people went and when and their movements. So she was also kind of controlling them in that sense of psychologically, you know, they've literally physically signed a contract, which is one of the ways they got caught out because he had this murder contract on him. And this was actually found by the police. And so she was very clever in the way she manipulated these people. But I think that anyone in her life, she would have had total domination over. Otherwise, she wouldn't have had them in her lives at all. Because you see that as a pattern with these individuals. They will allow people into their circles who they can control. But if they can't control you and you're a problem for them, they will either reject you from their circle or, worst case scenario, actually kill you, you know, if you become enough of an obstacle to them. So you're either in because they can use you, they can control you, or you are very out and potentially at risk. Did the murder contracts reveal anything about the price, the dollar amount? You know, how much does it cost or what is it worth to someone to take a life? And Tim, in your experience, having spoken with hitmen, what motivates them? Is it money? Oh, look, generally it's not a written contract because that's evidence. It's often about agreeing on a price. There's been cases that have been described in the media where hitmen haven't been paid the full amount. You know, it might be putting a deposit on a car, I'll pay you so much now, and on completion of the contract you'll be paid the balance, and then after the person's dead it's very hard to chase the money. So from my experience, I'm not aware of written contracts because that would just be, you know, gormless beyond belief. It's just another bit of evidence. But, of course, I think in this case there was a contract and that was part of the evidence that, brought them down. Yeah, I don't know if there was a dollar amount actually attached to that contract, but you know, I mean, I think with generally these things people have different prices, don't they? You know, so what is $50 to one person is not $50 to another person. And so somebody who's a true hitman, they will be skilled, they'll be recognized, you know, people know who they are in those kind of darker circles of the world, and they will have a price depending on complexity and all of that whereas The interplay between the relationship with David Key and Michelle here, I think, adds another layer of complexity to that. So I don't know what dollar value he put on or what other promises she had made him or in what other ways she had coerced him. And I'll just leave that as a kind of open statement. But certainly she was very sexually coercive. And often these women are not what you wouldn't necessarily look at them and think they're like super attractive. There's something about these women that some men, a type of man, cannot resist. And I think they're drawn to that power, to be honest. So what the actual, what the promise was, I don't know. But the cost, obviously, to David Key was huge because, you know, he went to prison for life as well. I know when the gangland wars in Melbourne were occurring in the 90s, just in passing, 23 of the deceased at one point had been a client of mine. So uh, I know a fair bit about what was going on there. And and my understanding was with some of these big hits, the going price was about $150,000 to $300,000. Other cases, look, I've heard of people killing people for, you know, almost a motor car or $10,000. And the frightening thing about all this is that, A, life is very cheap in the eyes of some, because they have no empathy or remorse and, you know, killing someone is like swatting a fly. You know, if it buys me a new car or gets me a trip overseas, I'll do it. It depends on the value of the target and what people are prepared to pay and what people are prepared to accept in exchange for taking the risk. I mean, any contract killing, any murder, but particularly a contract killing, you know, you're looking at life without parole in all likelihood. And those that have been caught that I'm aware of are doing incredibly lengthy sentences as a consequence. So they want to be well paid for what they're doing. Because you've got to remember, David Key also probably thought he was in love with Michelle Burgess. 
because she was literally saying to him, you know, he was doing it because he loved her at the end of the day, or at least thought he did. And that's what she's saying to him. If you love me, prove your love, you know, prove your love by killing her. Drugs were involved in that relationship too, weren't they? And yes. would that have influenced the process? Oh, certainly. I mean, yeah. I mean, it certainly influences your thought patterns, et cetera, doesn't it? I mean, obviously there's a chemical change. So she knew exactly how to manipulate this man into this. And yeah, he would have been doing it for reward, but ultimately he thought he was doing it for love, which is ironic because she's killing her husband. She's in this relationship with this other man. There's this legion of other, other men. And yet he thinks that this is love. You know, it, you just got to wonder what is going on in these men's brains when they're dealing with black widows that they don't see that they are just a pawn in these women's games. You know, I agree with that, but it happens in a lot of relationships and it's a bit like, I mean, it's an analogy I use, it's not original, but it's like cooking frogs, you know, you put them in cold water, you gradually turn up the temperature and all of a sudden you've got a cooked frog. I'm sure a lot of these people don't understand at the time that the relationship commences that there's an end game in the mind of the other person, which is going to be that they're going to be asked to kill somebody. It's like, you know, picking up your first drink. Uh, For a lot of people, do they really think they're going to end up an alcoholic? I think with these people, they go into it, they're very naive and they love the love bombing, they love all the excitement surrounding it. But by incremental steps, their behaviour and their attitude and their thinking is changed and shaped and then they're in way too deep and they can't get out because they don't want to give up the relationship. So... When you think about it, it's crazy thinking. It's not psychotic thinking. They're not out of touch with reality. They clearly know what they're doing and they're clearly capable of planning what they do, unlike people who are insane who, you know, generally shambolic and disorganised and, you know, they can't organise anything. So they know what they're doing. But I think with some of these people, it never starts out with them thinking, boy, you know, in a year from now or six months from now, I'm going to be involved in a contract killing and I'm going to be the offender, which speaks to the power of that dynamic with the women that control them. In terms of Michelle's husband, Darren, and the murder plot there, was that something that she was ever actually planning on going through with or was that just leverage or blackmail to kind of spur heaven on with to murder Carolyn? Oh, I think she absolutely intended to go through it. She'd written up a murder contract with photos and everything of both Darren and Carolyn. And I think Carolyn was just the first. So David was smart enough to destroy the murder contract with Carolyn. He apparently ate that in a sandwich. But the second murder contract for Darren, he still had in his possession. He thought he'd destroyed it, but he hadn't. So there was a murder contract the same. So I reckon she would have wound him up set him off just like she did before, provided him with drugs, you know, mentally wound him up, psychologically wound him up because that contract existed. So I absolutely think Darren was next because that was probably the one she genuinely wanted out of the way because then she could move on after Kevin and after David to the next victim. So yeah, I think Darren was probably saved by the fact that the forensic evidence led them to David Key because he was wearing the same boots he wore to the house. So it was like that Cinderella story. How do we find out who's been at this house? Oh, let's find the prints to these shoes, which were fairly unusual. Oh, look, we've put, found David Key and he's wearing the same shoes, the same shoes and had the murder contract on him. So we're not talking a genius here. Had it not been for the fact that he was really not very competent as a hitman, he's like the bungling hitman, Darren may well have been next. Three people are arrested and charged over this murder eventually. David Key, the hitman, gets 20 years and Michelle and Kevin receive the longest sentences in South Australian legal history, 30 years each, no parole. But even behind bars, Michelle has continued with her controlling behaviour, her manipulations. What do we know about how Michelle Burgess has tried to leverage that control even behind bars? Yeah, so what we know about Michelle behind bars is she's working it. She is 
trying to control the guards to the point where guards are not allowed to kind of be alone with her because she's still trying to coerce and control people. And you've got to remember, she's going to pick her marks. She's going to work on them. She's going to start complimenting them, you know, and she's still up to it. And she's up to her old tricks. And a woman like Michelle is frankly never going to stop because she can't. She cannot stop. And so any man who is of a type that is going to fall for this, that needs a bit of an ego massage, Michelle is going to be wiggling her way in there. So yeah, some guards are not allowed to deal with her at all because she is just too manipulative and she can actually get things from these people to assist her inside. So she has to be kept away from them and they're not allowed to see her on her own. It's really quite extraordinary. And that's the point. In any context where they've got a bit of wiggle room, these dynamics come into play. So whether it's in the community at large or within the constrictions of a penal establishment, they will find a way to manipulate, cajole and use other people. And so my final comment on that is it just proves the point they never change. They have no insight. There's no remorse. She's now in a different environment, but she's working out the best way to play that environment to her benefit and to the detriment of all around her. So uh, it's a fascinating case. Thanks to Tim and Xanthi for assisting us to tell this story. If you'd like to hear more of their conversations about what really makes offenders behind some of history's most notorious cases tick, you can find a link for their new podcast, Motive and Method, in our episode description. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Emma Gillespie, with audio design by Rhiannon Mooney. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. And if you have any feedback about today's episode, or maybe you have an idea of a case we should cover next, you can get in touch with us via email at truecrimeatmamamia.com.au. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.